what a reach, what a great reach. And welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. And welcome back uh, to those of you who have participated in the past in uh, this Sketchbook Traveler virtual workshop series with James McElhenney. Uh, as you may know by now, I'm Sarah Linda Licklau, Director of Education here at the Hudson River Museum. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Mark Taylor, uh, who is the manager of planetarium and science programs. Uh, because as we know, we are totally interdisciplinary and uh, landscape is very much a part of um, the ecology education that, you know, that we prize here at the museum. So um, thank you so much, Mark, for being with us today. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, James, who is an author, educator, historian, and journal painter, has been leading this five-part series of workshops and lectures inspired by the exhibition Landscape, Art, and Virtual Travel, highlights from the collections of the HRM and Art Bridges, uh, in which participants such as yourselves have been invited to develop your skills for mindful travel through journaling. Today, uh, the artist will conduct a professional critique of participants watercolors and I want to thank those of you who shared images of your work uh, for the slideshow that James has prepared which will be a springboard for discussion and everyone in this workshop will now have the opportunity to appreciate what others have done I would be remiss if I did not thank Art Bridges for their support of today's program and for their generous underwriting of this entire series uh, let's see, I mentioned your microphones are muted. You can control them as well as your video. There is live transcript at the bottom where if you uh, would like to avail yourselves of closed captioning, just uh, click on that icon. And if you prefer to put your questions or comments in the chat, please do so. And we will be checking that throughout the program. So now it is my honor to introduce visual artist, author, independent scholar and fine press publisher, James Lancel McElhenney, who by now needs no introduction. Thank James. You, Sarah Linda. Okay, uh, I'm gonna beg a, uh, a bit of a favor. Could you, uh, when we get rolling, could you just sort of keep an eye on the clock and make sure to let me know when, when uh, we've got 10 people mm -hmm. uh, on uh, in this critique okay. and, um, uh, we only have 90 minutes, so I want there to be time for Q&A and discussion. So when we get to, if I'm talking about one person's work, could you let me know when we're hitting about the seven minute mark? That'll... Seven minutes. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do my best. Good. Okay. I will, okay, I will, I will set my stopwatch on my phone. And let's see what happens. I apologize in advance. Oh no, I'm going to mute myself. So, okay, uh, no, that'd be great. So just yeah, uh, yeah, unmute and just say, uh, you know, heads up or something. It's, oh, okay, you got it. Everybody right. enjoy and thank you so much for for being here today, James. Thank Take you, away. Sarah Linda. Appreciate Take it. Away. Mm -hmm. Oh, <clears throat> welcome everybody. As Sarah Linda um, said, we are. Uh, we are we are uh, having a critique. I don't really call it a professional critique. I would call it more of a celebration of of what we've been exploring over the last several months. And uh, uh, you know, we have works from ten people who have kindly shared uh, images from their own practice that we're going to be able to discuss. And as Sarah Linda uh, explained, where you can uh, unmute. Uh, and make comments. And the way it's going to work is this. I'm going to invite uh, each artist, if they're present, uh, to make some comments about uh, their work and what they were thinking about and what their goals were and what they were experiencing at the time they produced the piece. And then I'm going to make a few comments and I'm going to suggest some research opportunities that might help them uh, to develop their practice uh, moving forward. So here we go. Uh, the first artist is, where do we go here? Okay. The first artist up is Martha Taylor from State College, PA. Are you here, Martha? 
Yes. Okay, well, <clears throat> you're unmuted. Great. So uh, we have a couple of images. You got this one and this one. And uh, perhaps you could start by uh, walking us through this one that's on the screen. Okay, this one that's on the screen is from a, a Facebook group called uh, Landscape Reference Photos for Artists. And a lot of photographers put their work on there. Uh, and so it is painted from a photo. Uh, the name is down below, and I'm not sure I can pronounce it, Nwe Yu Kane, and it is a, a scene in Myanmar. And uh, I just liked the backlighting, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to try out what you've been talking about. Uh, I used a, a pink um, fine point marker to, to do what you do with the orange, and I wanted to try doing that dark first, you know, the dark and the light with an underpainting. I felt like the, the foreground there got a little muddy. And I wish, you know, if I were to do it again, I would try harder to be more discreet as to which is shaded and which is, is bright. But I felt like the sunshine behind the trees came out pretty well. Yeah, I, I can see, I can see what you're up to. And the, this whole idea of of light coming forward through a screen of foliage is um, a really sort of appealing idea. It is, I, I think also, let me ask you, what, what, uh, what color were you underpainting with? Just I used, I used a pale yellow for the light and I used the, um, not burn number burnt sienna for the for the dark i i i just uh I posted an image on uh the base camp page on facebook uh that that uh i i cherry picked this idea out of an 18th century topographical landscape manual where the author suggested using violet a violet. yeah i saw that and, and, and I thought reason, that was a good idea. Yeah, the reason why is that violet will be subsumed by all of the colors that come on top of it so that it won't be asserting itself beyond its function as just a place to locate darks. And Yeah, and hang on one second. Alvin, um, I'm on speaker, so if you can wait like five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, We're going to vacuum. <laughs> if... Uh, uh, <clears throat> And also for the yellow, I would probably encourage you to use some kind of low chroma yellow, like like a yellow ochre, you know, mm -hmm. okay. raw sienna that's watered down. You know, you know, you're just at that point. You're just trying to tell yourself, I've got a light, dark, warm, cool, simultaneous contrast yeah. going on, yeah. and you just want to map that out, and then you can try to develop, uh, you know, all of the colors. Um, on top of that, you know, with okay. glaze. And, uh, and this is one of the things that I think people need to understand is that you can glaze with watercolor. You can lay watercolor over top of watercolor. There is a general myth that, you know, it's one shot and you're done. I think that's a particular kind of cult of, of art technique as parlor trick that uh, is really not, has no real historic grounding. And I, I mean, I'm, as you know, I'm going back to the expeditionary art and 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 sort of the same foundations upon which people like Turner built his practice. And and it's it's perfectly possible to glaze with watercolor. And it's just a matter of touch, learning how to load the brush and learning how to lay the color down so that you don't disrupt what's underneath. And uh, it's that's that can only be learned by practice. So let's look at this piece, and uh, why don't you tell us about, you made a trip down the Shenandoah National Park? Yes, we uh, visited my daughter in Virginia, and coming home, we came up the Skyline Drive, and this was uh, one of the pull-offs uh, with a view out over the Shenandoah Valley and the, the mountains beyond, um, and so to make it... I, I cut out the portion, a portion of the the map that they give you when you when you go through the entrance, uh, just to show. And I'm not sure. I, 
unfortunately, I didn't notice which spot I was at when I took the picture. I know I was facing about southwest, but I don't know which of those spots it was. And on our trip, I had noticed the redbud trees. And in Pennsylvania, where I live, uh, they, they hadn't even bloomed yet. You could see the very, very tight buds, uh, but, but barely anything was happening. And as we went further south, the redbud trees started to bloom more. Then I noticed that you know the, the elevation has the same effect as going north and south. And so I thought I would make a little uh, graph of that on the on the other page. Well, that's kind of cool. That's what Humboldt saw when he when he failed to climb Chimborazo, but he got up to like twelve thousand feet. But then he was seeing at every level that he was seeing plants. Uh, there in the Andes that he would have seen in Europe at the same elevation. And so, you know, this, this introduces a kind of scientific narrative, which is, which is, which is cool. And I think um, this kind of journaling is really useful because after all topographical landscape painting was created so that people would know where they were when they were looking at the map. So yeah. had you had you marked the location of this particular turnoff and let's say a compass heading and maybe the GPS coordinates, then somebody else could go there and say, "Oh, this is what Martha." Oh, yeah. So that would be something to do, and I do that all the time. And and I think that you know I I, I would also make note of of you know the weather, the temperature, the wind speed and direction. Just you know like pretend you're an explorer. And, uh, and it becomes a kind of game, it's fun, it makes travel more interesting. And when you have a look at these notebooks, then all of a sudden you're, um, um, you know, you've got a lot more information and a lot more ways to trigger memories. Excuse me, yeah. it's seven minutes. Thank you, Mario. You know, let's, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. My, my next point, which is, um, uh, I wanted to talk a little about this practice of um, of expeditionary journaling. So I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, on the left is Franz Post, who was a Dutch artist who went to South America in the 1600s. He was one of the first trained artists from Europe to go to the Americas to produce works of art um, um, on the spot, as it were. And to the right, you can see an artist who was, had adopted the same practice, but it's 200 years later. You know, this is Eugene Delacroix, who went uh, to Algeria and, uh, and kept these detailed notebooks where you can combine writing and uh, drawing. And after all, bear in mind that drawing, writing is just another form of drawing, and drawing is just another form of writing. So if you're writing on the page, it becomes a visual element, part of the drawing, and you have to think of it that way. And then there's another artist who is um, Jean McKay, who, who does these journals, uh, travel journals, nature journals. And of course, here you can see she also has this kind of, uh, kind of calligraphic approach to note taking. Which, which adds to the aesthetic of the drawing. And uh, you know, Jean is known for her books on uh, travel journaling, and uh, a lot of them are accessible to young readers. They're really terrific stuff, so I would encourage you to check her out. Any questions, Martha? No, thank you very much for your uh, feedback. All right, thanks for, thanks for participating. Really appreciate it. All right, next, Molly Bolger Jensen. Molly, where are you? Are you here? Right here. So this is Valparaiso, Chile. Hello, Molly. Hi. So wh where are we? I know you travel a lot. Where are we? Uh, we are... As you said, Valparaiso, Chile, okay. and we are looking north, and of course we're looking um, the south at the South Pacific. But I'm looking at the Bay Area, and 
down, I was kind of on top of a, I was on the left, I was looking through the hotel, my hotel window. And that, that room was a prized a possession of mine because I was mesmerized by the view. And, uh, and the electrical so, wires, right? And the electrical wires on the right. That was a, a few blocks from the hotel on the same road looking down. And, um, and yes, the color, the bright color there, I noted. And all the wires, you know, all the so-called debris. <laughs> and uh, through, it, you know, through which we look at the landscape and uh, the water. Well, uh, it, it, it's interesting because there's, there's a famous American artist who did a painting of Valparaiso, and I wonder if you know who that is. No, I don't. James Whistler. Oh, Whistler, really? He, after he flunked out of West Point, he got um, a job as a topographical artist and was sent to Valparaiso. Valparaiso. Where he did maps and uh and and on his spare in his spare time did his own views of the harbor but anyway i wanted to sort of make a comparison between these which i think are quite enchanting and and somebody like matisse of course everybody knows these these wonderful pictures of um you know the view from uh, from his apartment or his hotel room on you know the Côte d'Azur and Nice and uh, and the similar narrative in uh, the abstract paintings of Diebenkorn, which an example here on the right of the Ocean Park series. I spent a summer in Ocean Park and I met Diebenkorn, and the view from his studio is basically what we're looking at in this abstract painting, except he rearranged all of the elements in a kind of cryptic way, you know, so that we're not looking at a literal picture, but we're mm -hmm. still having a look at the concrete strip along Nielsen Way and the parking lot behind the studio and the blue Pacific sky and the angles of the Ocean Park bungalows and so forth. And uh, so I think that's, uh, that's a comparison that I wanted to make. And uh, then I'm looking at this piece that you also sent and having a look up. What it's a very unusual perspective. What inspired you to do this? Um, that was on, on a trip with my husband. We went to Paris for a few days, uh, which is unusual. <laughs> and we were walking around the Latin corner and, uh, and just looking up. And I, I, well, I love all the little apartment buildings and, and, mm -hmm. But the sky too, I thought was unusual. It's a nice contrast. It's a funny. Of, it's a yeah. It's a it's a great place for skies, Paris. Yeah. It's also a great place for dust on the shoes. So <laughs> at the end of the day, I've got you know the dust on my shoes and and uh, spend a lot of time looking up. But this has a very abstract quality as well, and I think it's it's interesting and it's it's a positive thing you went beyond mere description to try to find some mm. some unusual perspective and here this is this is near your house in santa fe right yes yeah i um started um well i started working with the watercolor and in um, the sketchbooks and i really uh, what's new to me is the uh, is the mountain range and um how to deal with it and um so I, I went out there and um, this was unusual picture for me because I started it at, rather than using just photographs and maybe some, a few pencil sketches. I, I went to the place, as you suggest, and started there and um, and then stop and then go back home and finish it that, that, um, with the photograph as a second kind of resource, you know, not yeah. the first resource. So. It was interesting about this, I thought, is that I painted the background first on site with the light, and then I had to stop because this, the light went away or whatever, and right. I was tired. And I went back home, and then I put in the foreground, and I had that kind of, you know, the reason I love this fence and this dead old 
you know, dying tree. And anyway, so it just worked out. It just worked out. And, and it was kind of one of my first successes in, in terms of working first, starting the picture in front or being there and then going back into it later. Well, I think the reason, the reason why you want to, you want to begin on site is so that gives you a certain authority. And it also, it also builds memory of the place that you're not going to get from just going and snapping a photograph and right. running home and copying the photograph. If you're there for right. a couple of hours and, and experiencing the place, <clears throat> and you go back and look at the photograph, you're no longer dependent on the photograph, but it right. becomes a source of information. Right. And you have the, you know, the DNA of the piece is your experience. And I guess right. that's really the point of, of this workshop is, is not how do we make pictures of, of, of scenery that we uh, visit, but, but how, do we, how do we make pictures of our experience being there? And that's, and I think being there first is really important because that gives you like a proprietary authority over what you're doing. It's not like you're not starting with a photograph, you're using the photograph as a kind of uh, like lifeline on you want to be a millionaire, you know, that show where you call somebody up. If you get stuck, you can always look at the photograph, but you're not dependent on it. Right, and I, I, I love that, that these workshop, workshops have really helped me with that and to help me invent more. Well, let me go to the other yeah. things. <laughs> seven minutes, okay. And we are at seven minutes, James. Uh, okay. I just wanted to mention, Molly, thank you for all of these watercolors. Go ahead. I think that this, that, that this image is, is one of the more compelling ones because of the variety of textures and visual elements and tonal contrast and color. And when I looked at this, I immediately thought of Marsden Hartley, you know, and I think that uh, you happen to be in an area of the country where there's a rich history of painting and pictorial exploration. And so it's, it's the challenge in a way is to try to do something that doesn't look like uh, Marsden Hartley or Maynard Dixon or, or like a Victor Higgins or like one of the Taos, school or Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, so uh, I think you're doing that. And it's, I think it's smart to make, make, uh, um, I think it's smart to be as connected as you are to your surroundings and also to begin uh, each piece on site. Is that, like I said, that gives you a certain authority and that makes you less dependent on uh other sources you have your own memory to draw on that don't underestimate that i mean hartley clearly was a very imaginative painter and uh, all right so thank you molly any questions thank you no thanks a lot i really appreciate all your help oh, and uh, i've loved your workshops my Jim. pleasure thank you thank you <laughs> uh okay barbara barbara hawes here hi can you hear me I can. And and the one on the right actually goes the other way, but. Um, oh, really? Um, okay. And I did not partake in the, your actual workshops, but um, number one, I wanted to support the Hudson River Museum. I'm always um, love the engagement of being a part of a crit, or as you called it, a celebration. Um, so just glad to be, um, listening and learning so tell us about the piece on the left since it is right side up uh okay i don't pretend to be a landscape painter i do have a painting practice but during covid i just set out an exercise a daily exercise of saying well you can't go anywhere and there's nowhere to go so what do we what can we see uh right where we are um, and so just looking out my um, window, I overlook a reservoir in Hamden, Connecticut and East Rock Park. Um, so just allow taking markers and pencils and trying to find structure um, in what I'm seeing. 
and also putting aside assumptions as the great Cezanne was always about observing, observing, observing. Right. And <clears throat> make marks in response to his observation, never assuming. Well, also with Cezanne, he's, he's avoiding as long as possible uh, abandoning that Empir that empiricism and then starting to like make a painting or trying to finish a painting. So, you know, he gives us a lot of um, responses with, with a lot of open space. And so you have an incomplete painting that forms a complete idea. And I was saying to another artist I know that in a way, Cezanne's paintings are like pictures of what science is. And by that, I mean hard won, uh, hard won fragments of certainty separated by vast expanses of unknowing. But you can still sort of connect the dots. You know, you can go from one response to another and imagine what's in between. And sort of that's how science works too. And I think that that if we think about the show he did in Princeton, or the show that Princeton University Museum did uh, last year during COVID, the show that nobody saw, it, the revelations were that Cezanne was actually keenly interested in natural science and uh, geology, and that his frequent companion on painting expeditions uh, was, was a geologist, an amateur painter. And there are all these great quotes about, you know, wanting to understand geology the same way that uh, a figure painter wants to understand anatomy, you know. And uh, so that puts him in a whole new light, the whole idea that Cezanne turned away from nature to discover modern art is pretty much nonsense when you think about the fact that the man died of pneumonia after being caught in a rainstorm outdoors because he refused to come inside but but um you know or he was caught in a rainstorm and ultimately took sick and died as a consequence of it but but you know his engagement with nature was intense and yeah. so let and i guess the other point i'd make is that you know what's a, is a landscape and abstraction are inextricably intertwined that the earliest <clears throat> landscape paintings with the exception of Malevich, Kandinsky, Mondrian and so forth grew directly out of a landscape practice. Mm. And so what I want to talk about, well, you know, we can have a look at these too. These are your, are these right side up? Yeah, I think so. Yes. And the one on the left, I, 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 I love Japanese woodblock prints and the sensitivity and the softness and the gradation. So I was sort of tapping into Hakusai on the left, um, but also really trying, you, I love what you just said about Cezanne, hard won fragments of certainty in the midst of vast space of, I think- it's expanse of the knowing, yeah. So. And, and because of, those that space and also he never made a mark that wasn't extraordinarily seen and intentional there's an in, a very intense energy when you stand in front of a saison they they're they they're so there's a tenuous energy that is so extraordinary and because i generally paint in oil and acrylic i often get bogged down so i love the well, freshness and immediacy of the approach that you're teaching. Well, the, the point of Cezanne is that every mark is a decision. It's not a technical move. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm doing a technique that first you do this and then you do that. You break the egg, you, you know, you, you know, you cream the butter, whatever. I mean, it's not a recipe. It's like yeah. every mark is a considered decision. And, and, uh, uh, I think a lot of people want it to be technique because then that would make it easy. Then you could learn yes. how to do it. And one of the things I think about Cezanne is that that the way his work looks invites people to think that they 
they can do what he's doing. He makes it look easy, but it's actually very hard. I think another person who, who, whose style is basically a practice is somebody like Giacometti, you know, mm, yeah. Where it's not really a style. Although if you think it's a style, then you think you can do it, but it doesn't make any sense when you try because he's looking and wiping it out and doing it again, doing it again. And, you know, his wife, Annette, used to have to sneak in, in, you know, the middle of the night and take the canvas off the easel. Otherwise he'd wake up and wipe it out in the morning. So, <laughs> hustle it off to the gallery so they can pay the rent but uh i love jacometti drawings and the one on the left maybe is a, a true an, in honor of because he's always feeling for the structure well and and you know the one on the right too has a sort of there's a tension between the graphic elements and the color elements and i i just uh how are we doing sarah linda i was just going to Apologize for interrupting seven Fine. minutes. Yeah. Okay, so the one on the left to me actually does seem a little bit, um, does seem to be mindful of Cezanne, and like you said, possibly Giacometti, but the color, you know, the patterning of the color, patches of color, also the one on the right, uh, seems to set up a tension between the graphic elements, the linear elements, and these, these, uh, these, you know, patches of color. And so this made me think of uh, like early Diebenkorn in a way. Oh, those are great. Wow. <clears throat> and Gorky, because Gorky more, I mean, Diebenkorn later on in his Ocean Park series did have a pretty insistent linear element, but Gorky in these, uh, in these later surrealist works are, you know the line is is such a an expressive part of them, and he's doing them. You know how he's making those lines? He's making them with a with a dagger brush, which is the kind of sign painting brush, which is the tiny handle and a long. Uh, you know the brush itself is long and tapering, wow. and you you load it up and do these loopy lines. And uh, uh, the another artist who used that brush a lot was de Kooning. You can see it in his work as well. But, you know, again, I mean, the point is, I guess the point I want to make with your work is that, that, that if you choose to see a difference between landscape painting and abstraction, well, that's your decision. I think, I think there really is very little, formally speaking, because both are pictures of space and light and color, you know, and one happens to refer to a particular location and the other, the abstraction is the location. And that's the only difference in my mind. Cool, thank you. That's yeah, and the other artists I would look at like Jake Berteau, Jack yes. Walker, uh, who are sort of keeping one foot in each realm. You know, there's a little bit of representation and there's a lot of uh, abstraction. So anyway, let's thank you. Any questions? Thank you, John Walker. I haven't looked at him in a while. Thank you. Look, look, he's doing very interesting stuff. Yeah. Great. And uh, OK, Barbara, any questions? No, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. OK, Terry Muller, are you here? I think Terry may be. Uh, she teaches at the Savannah College of Art and Design, and she may not be here. So I'll just I'll just take her side in this. And I'm looking at these paintings. These are these are watercolors of the uh, wetlands and tidal areas around Savannah, Georgia, and of course it'd be the like places like uh, um, you know like a, a Tybee Island and. Uh, uh, the whole, you know, the Prince of Tides world and, uh, uh, you know, exploring effects of light and, and texture. And this one too, um, I'm kind of enjoying the fact that she's using the drawing with a brush and uh, trying to make different patterns. But in both of these, both of these pictures, I think uh, the the light and atmosphere is really foregrounded and uh, that's, that's a priority. And uh, 
I wouldn't say they have an impressionist quality. I would say they have, um, you, you might call it luminism, but they do seem to me to speak to, especially these late light pictures speak to me about um, uh, some 19th century painters like Louis Mignot and, and uh, some of the, and Martin Heed, H-E-A-D-E. Uh, but this piece, which is more developed, I think is is mm. quite engaged. And I get the feeling like the other two, and I wish she could join us. I think something came up at school. She had to go to a meeting or or uh, maybe had to teach a class. But um, But with a painting like this, it's really composed the way that tree leans across towards the far shore and uh, the sort of shadow of the water on the river and um, all the details of foliage, different textural qualities. And uh, so I think, I think this, this painting is quite successful. Mm -hmm. I do see, uh, you know, that there is uh, a kind of uh, reduction, if you will, of specificity when we get into the far shore. And that's, you know, perhaps that's because she, she's using a kind of atmospheric perspective that when you're further away from things, everything gets kind of fuzzy. And when when they're closer to you, they're, they're clearer and in sharper focus. Um, but I think this is a really interesting, interesting painting. And when, when I have a look at it, it makes me, reminds me of some earlier works in a way the aesthetic is, is, is a little Claudian, you know, it's got this, the foliage on one side, a dark foreground with a diagonal leading us into the space, a repoussoir, and then light uh, in, you know, the middle ground, and then, uh, like looking off to the distance. So when I was having a look at Terry's work, I thought, well, who could I think of as being sort of a, uh, a person for her to dialogue with? And I came up with Don Stinson. I don't know if you know who Don Stinson is. Yeah, he's a contemporary painter. He shows uh, at Gerald Peters Gallery, where I also show. Uh, he's a Denver-based, now Des Moines based, he's sort of living between Iowa and Colorado. He's from Texas and he's mostly known for these, these paintings, contemporary landscapes of uh, sort of the old West. They're sort of modern views of uh, a landscape, a legendary landscape that uh, with these modern intrusions like the railroad crossing barriers and the highway. He also does things like abandoned drive-in theaters and food stands along the highway and so forth, sort of modern ruins in this vast landscape. But his work also has this kind of expeditionary spirit where, you know, he's really trying to capture the character of the place. And I don't think it's just having to do with uh, realism as a style. I think, I think that personally, I don't care a thing about that. I think that in Don's case, he's really, he's really trying to do a poor, he's trying to portray a specific location uh, and not just the location, but a moment in time, the weather conditions, the atmosphere, um, what's going on. There's a little anxiety too, because we're by the side of the road and we could be in a car approaching the railroad gate and any moment those red and white striped barriers could come down and we could be sitting there for two hours while a thousand boxcars roll by. So there's a story, you know, and I think that when we look at this, uh, I'm thinking 
about all sorts of narratives that could exist. And, um, you know, what brings us to the edge of the river? And then, of course, because of my interest in expeditionary, I think about people like William Bartram, who traveled throughout the South in the late 18th century and early 19th century and, and uh, studying the flora and fauna or something like Mark Dion, who reprised that, that trip uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions? Since the artist isn't here, neither of them. I do, Martha. Go for it. I'm just wondering, um, because of the, the shape of that, I'm wondering, is that a sketchbook? It's awfully detailed. Um, how big do we know is the original? Oh, I think this, this watercolor here is, is, is fairly large. I would say it's probably, you know, 20 by 30 inches. Mm. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a larger watercolor. And I think, uh, okay, thanks. Well, I don't know what size Terry's is. It, she didn't give me dimensions. But I, I would suspect this is not uh, a, a minute sketchbook painting, although it could be. Uh, I, I get the feeling it would be something, it could be nine by 12 or 16 by 20, I don't know. It's good question. I'm sorry I don't have that information to share. And you're coming in right on time, James. Okay, right. well in that case, let's move forward to Kathy. Firamoska, you're here, Kathy? I'm here. Yeah. How's, how's everything in Staten Island? I put New York City. That's okay. My, my heart's in the city. <laughs> okay. Well, Staten Island technically is the city. Yeah. yeah but it's a county of Richmond. But uh, it's the suburbs. <laughs> right. Well, uh, so tell us a little about, about what we're looking at here. We have. Uh, we have two watercolors. Where are we and uh, what size is this? Um, okay. This one is, um, uh, this was an Umbria from a photograph that I took. And this size, I think it was, cause it's, it's, it was sold, so it's long gone, but it was about nine by 13, something like that. Okay. And the other one was is more recent, and that was uh, six by nine. So um, this one does look a little smaller. Yeah, that's six uh, by nine. Now, why did why did you tape off the edges in the? And beam? this one, um, I know, because I do like the the ed edge to be a little bit more organic. But uh, it was, it had to be specifically for a show called Six by Nine. So I, I just taped it off like that. I, I do prefer the other, um, you know, to have it a little looser, to have it bleed out. Well, that it does sort of, when you do that and you let the edges be a little rough, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, the decal on the edge of a sheet of, of fine laid paper. Mm -hmm. And so you have... Uh, it speaks a little about the process, the way the decal on the paper sort of puts you, helps you imagine the screen, the pulp, the whole process, you know, and uh, and also I think with with framing the image in this way on the page, it's less mechanical, right. and uh, and it feels it feels a little more intuitive somehow, you know, as a format. And uh, uh, so both of them are done from photographs? Yes, yeah. yeah. Have, I need to do more on site. You know, I'm, I haven't done much on site. But well, that's. Well, how did you learn? Were, were you taught by, by uh, uh, people who work from photographs? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I've worked from photographs for many years, and then maybe about 20 years ago. I studied with Rick Rosen at the National Academy. Well, Rick's a friend of mine and uh, his work, you know, he's interesting because I'll talk about him in a minute, but uh, you know, he's, he's interesting because he works from photographs, but 
he's also using very uh, historic techniques. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and just did you lay this down first in graphite? Uh, with a 3H pencil, so a very light pencil. And then, yeah, just started to work the sky and work forward. Right. So, well, the biggest area in a painting like this would be the sky. And then, um, you know, depending upon on how you organized your palette and everything, you could start with that and then lay in blues to stand for all the darks and then come in with other colors to um uh, you know create warm cool contrast and so forth but i like what you said about laying uh the you know the initial um glaze or not glaze but the initial uh, phase with uh violet i'm gonna try that yeah light light violet wash just to map out where the darks are okay. that's it and actually i put up on the on the um uh, uh on the base camp page on facebook i did put up a, a series of images of a piece i did mm -hmm. which is actually right behind me this mm -hmm. i saw that on the and, and and uh and you see this is not big this is a mm -hmm. but but yeah it started out as a simple line drawing but broken lines not solid lines broken lines mm -hmm. and uh which i know rick does and the broken lines and then a violet wash just where all the darks were and then this gradually getting darker and introducing warm colors and then and then elaborating more and more and of course once you learn how to lay watercolor wet watercolor over dry watercolor you can work forever you can work on on it as long as you please you know you're not gonna you're not gonna distress what's underneath i'm yeah. gonna try that with the violet because i that's something new for me well it, it it comes right out of uh like a book from the 1790s so i mean it's like there's nobody in art school teaching in art very few people teaching in art schools who know this stuff? I think Rick is a a, a a rare example. I think maybe you can find some people in Britain that know this stuff, but not not in American art schools. I would be shocked, but uh, I I I might be wrong. I'm sure there are a handful of people who do. But uh, uh, anyway, I would encourage you to, like I was saying to Molly, first go out there and do it from life and spend a couple of hours getting to know the subject and then take your photograph come inside and elaborate okay okay all right thank you so when i was thinking of your work guess who i thought of rick gross yeah, <laughs> so and and uh yeah you could say and again again look here's the contrast square square mm -hmm. edges uh kind of organic edge right so there's the left and there's the right so but uh no, he does these very very detailed graphite drawings with 4h and 3h pencils and and broken lines and so forth and then just glazes over top say so just but they're they're quite marvelous yeah. and you are at seven minutes Excellent. So, timing. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and, and Rick, Rick is a guy who knows an enormous amount about the history and technique of watercolor and knows all about topographical painting and, and how they were done. People like Paul Sandby and, uh, uh, you know, the British military uh, artists who were trained who were trained to draw landscapes in an artistic way because the military believed that that would make them better observers. Okay. It was it, better artists, better observers. Okay, so Nancy, Vincent, are you here? I am here. Are you? Oh, there you yep, are. There I am. Okay, 
So you were in Maine, and yes. I gather that this image on the left with the birches is um, uh, a view of the place which inspired the watercolor on the right. That is correct. Okay. Um, you, well, I'm looking east at the Atlantic Ocean. Where are you in Maine? In Camden, Maine. Beautiful place. Yes. Um, I'm on the grounds of this uh, lovely, um, um, uh, you know, uh, hotel, bed and breakfast. Yes. And in, and in. So if you're in Camden, isn't that the Penobscot Bay or is that? The um, uh, yes. I mean, that would, uh, I think that's first. And then beyond that um, is the right. Uh, ocean. Right. Yeah. No, it's a, I know the area well. It's a terrific place and it's full of artists, you know. Uh, you people like Rackstraw Downs live there and uh, Red Grooms had a summer place, Alex Katz. Poets, John Ashbury, Edwin Denby, Neil Welliver, you know, uh, was up in Lincolnville. So there was a show. It's, this is, um, excuse me, uh, James, this is actually Lincolnville, just north of oh, um, Camden. Okay. okay. It is Lincolnville, to be exact, yes. So that is a great, that is a great place with a rich artistic history. Two years ago, there was a, there was a show about that whole circle of artists down at the uh, uh, Farnsworth Museum in Rockland, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is uh, uh, well worth seeing, and not just for the Wyatts, but for... I saw it for the Wyatts uh, several years ago. I did make it there, but not this trip. Okay. Well, look, uh, tell us a little about the painting on the right. What were you thinking about when you did it? Okay, um, this is um, totally plein air. Um, I had uh, two hours before my um, uh, um, daughter and son-in-law, um, <laughs> before we um, left uh, the inn. And it's just above the uh, shoreline um, at, at the bottom of a hill. And I just loved um, the uh, white birches, at, you know, leaning, you know, uh, uh, eastward. Uh, I had a white crayon with me and I had a Japanese um, uh, 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 pen, a uh, sailor pen um, with uh, water soluble ink. So I had a lot of fun um, using my white crayon and that um, uh, ink pen to uh, create the bark um, on the birches. Well, we were talking before about Welliver. He did a lot of painting of white, a lot of paintings of white birches. If you look up his work, Neil Welliver. Neil Welliver. Okay. Neil Welliver did a lot of paintings of white birches in Lincolnville. So he's. Uh, oh, for goodness' sake. <laughs> he would, yeah, anyway, uh, you know, just having looked at this painting, we were talking earlier with, uh, uh, like Kathy and. Molly and others about this idea of simultaneous contrast, warm and cool color. And what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing that you've done this very uh, detailed drawing. And it seems to me like in some areas it feels like it's a black and white drawing that has certain color elements. And I think the way you could make it, you could, you could boost, you know, the color a little bit would be uh, instead of dealing with the greens in terms of just light and dark, approach them from the standpoint of warm and cool. So let's say the light is a warm light, then the shadow is a cool color. So if, the, if you know, the lighter areas uh, tend towards yellow, mm -hmm. then the uh, darker areas would tend towards blue or violet. Okay. And, and so that would give you more of a feeling of light. You know, if you look at the photograph, that's kind of what happens optically anyway. When you look at the, the warm highlights, you say, okay, if those, those are warm, then what's this relative to that? And it would be, the answer would be cool. And so you think about warm and cool color, not just 
light and dark versions of a local color. All right. And, and, uh, and then the other thing too is, and this happens optically, we see something and we see it out of context with everything else and we put down what looks accurate. We try to match the color we're looking at on the page and it doesn't always work. And I'm looking at your painting and I would say the distance, you know, in the photograph, you know, the distance is this pale blue. Pale, pale. In, in yours, it's very dark, which what, what happens is it pulls that far shoreline forward in space so that mm -hmm. it reads too far yeah similar to this this tree branch here you know mm -hmm. the, the tonality it's the same as this it's the same as this it's the same as, as that and there's no distinction in terms of warm or cool Got so it. those areas all sit in the same place in space so mm -hmm. if you wanted to push this back what you would want to do would be maybe make it lighter, make it cooler. Same thing with the surface of the water, you know. Although you don't necessarily want to be literal and say, okay, you know, sky is blue, water is blue. You know, it's not a default choice. Water might be violet, but uh, I think too that there's this sort of green area that's bled into the water. And then this this to me is because it's the same as these other values doesn't sit back in space where you want it to be and, yes, and yes, so if you, if, you wanna, if you want to pick up this it see it feels like the water has been sort of stained there's this algae on the water now probably isn't really there but but what you can do is you can just take a either a sponge a wet sponge and just I pick it up mm -hmm. or what I prefer to do because it gives me more control is I would take a safety razor and just scrape it back to the white of the page very carefully so just to remove that um that's that that green and then mm -hmm. replace it with whatever color you want now bear in mind the texture of the paper is going to change so it's going to receive the watercolor in a different way. So you might have to do a couple of tests to know what, what to mix before you apply. And if you look at Winslow Homer, he does this a lot. He does a lot of scraping. And, and James, this is just a, just a note. It's over seven minutes. Oh, dear. Yeah, I know. I know. This is All right. This oh, one, one, Nancy, thank you. This one is... is uh, you know, I get the, I, I feel like perhaps this one's color wise a little more successful, but still, I think you could push the warm, cool contrast a little more. I think that, that, di that the distance here is reading where it belongs. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so I wanted to give you a couple of artists to think about. One, Winslow Homer. We just talked about Winslow Homer. But, you know, what he's doing here. He's laying down with gouache and opaque paint, or he might be taking a razor blade and scraping away little, little areas, little pieces. But you, you know, you really have to look at his work in person to see where he's doing what. And then the other artist, or if he used a white crayon. <laughs> I don't think he used white crayon, but but but. <laughs> I think, but I can gouache, perhaps. Yeah, he would have used a gouache or he would have scraped or yeah. both. And then the other artist I want to call your attention to, if you don't know about her, is Fidelia Bridges, who is a 19th mm -hmm. century woman artist, very successful, getting a lot of attention these days. And she uh, lived in the 1920s, was born in 1830 seven and was able to vote before she died so that was lucky for her but but her work is quite wonderful and i would encourage you to look at her too thank you yeah well any questions any questions Nancy? no i appreciate your uh comments james oh, very you. much thank you nice oh and one last thing i know um i'm reading uh, the book landmarks Good. It's a one by, by Robert uh, McFarlane. So thank you, um, uh, 
you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very good. I recommend it. To, I'll hold it up again for everybody to see. So this is, this is Landmarks by Robert McFarland. It's basically a narrative bibliography interspersed with glossaries of obscure terrain yes. in the British yes. Isles. But it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And anybody who wants to understand what landscape is uh, in, in practice uh, should read the book also. And, and of course, without saying people like J.B. Jackson, but I think, I think that that's a wonderful, it's a new book too. And it's a relatively new anyway. It's a, it's right. Right. Yeah. All right, let's look at the next person, Ranju. You here? Hello. Yes. yes, thank you. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Where are you? We can't... I live I live in Florida. And this is um how you demonstrated the other day. And oh, this was this was from episode uh four. I think last one. Yeah, right. Be before this. So I just sat here and did it. But um I really like uh, to do abstracts now. So. I know, and and I think I think that like we were saying before, uh, the difference between landscape painting and abstract painting, in my mind, is that a landscape painting uh, shows us uh, a physical place on the surface of the earth, whereas an abstract painting is the place itself okay and, uh but both both are involved with a with the poetry of space and light and texture and so forth and mm -hmm. and early at abstract painting grew directly out of uh the landscape practice of people like like pete mondrian and mm -hmm. vasily kandinsky and others you know so that they eased out of landscape painting into abstraction so I do, I do sketch from uh, my back porch, uh, looking at my backyard uh, every day and try and see if I can get better abstracts from it. Well, like I was saying about people like Diebenkorn or John Walker, you know, they're, draw they're drawing their abstraction from their experience of the spaces where they live and the space okay. no and uh so here's your work again whoops oh uh, yeah so this was this one you sent me a lot of images i can only share a few sure so, so so these these are evocative of landscape forms yes and the thing that i would like to challenge you to do would be maybe let drawing play a bigger role because I think that once you get, once you get the forms laid out, like the one on the right, which yeah. almost looks like a couple of figures dancing or something, uh -huh. uh, you, you want to think about several things. You want to create, find some way uh, to establish some kind of specificity, some kind of something that's particular, bring it into focus. Yeah. And, my feeling about your work is that that the, there's a lot going on, but it's not necessarily in focus. There's no, there's, there's, you have to give us something to hang on to. Okay. And I think the one on the right has more variation in terms of shape and mark and so forth, but it's all very much the same value. Yes. And the one on the left has more different values but it's every form is being treated with the same emphasis. Yes. So it's like, uh, you know, what do I look at first? How do I find my way around the composition? Is it just, you know, the diagonal from corner to corner and then these big shapes? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what, uh, how am I supposed to respond? And uh, I think, so I would encourage you to look at some abstract paint or some painters like, Emil Nolda, for instance, Emil Nolda, sort of a controversial artist because he was a German expressionist artist who, who uh, liked the Nazis until they locked them up 
under mm -hmm. him rest. But uh, uh, he is known for these intense colors. But even in this one, I mean, this is sort of similar to what you're trying to do here, which is why I picked it out. You know, these big forms are all kind of out of yeah. focus. But look at this line here. Mm -hmm. it, he creates this great tension here also. Okay. And uh -huh. also the way he's breaking up the space in this, I don't know that I would make a diagonal like that. That kind of cuts the painting in half and it makes us wonder what's what's more important, the bottom right or the top left. I don't know that that's the point. So here, there's more variation in the different size of the shapes. Yeah. And some are more intense than others. Uh -huh. Some are shifting chromatically, some are shifting tonally. Uh, there are different textures at play, different mm -hmm. smaller marks like these, you know, and then there's this line that creates this great sort of, uh, is it a, like a Lucio Fontana? Is it like a cut in the paper or is it, or is it a fold in the paper or is it a, uh, a, uh, like a textile where somebody's pulled out a thread. I don't know, but it's, it, 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 and it kind of moves a little bit too, you know? So mm -hmm. this comes down and it doesn't just go all the way across. If you look, he's done this too. Here's a diagonal here. Yeah. But he's playing with it. And then here, mm -hmm. and then it moves to here, and then it moves to there, and so forth. And okay. uh, um, so I would spend a little more time. I think maybe you're stepping away from these works before, before you know you're you're taking the cookies out of the oven before they're done. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I, would, I would leave them in the. You know, you got to burn a few cookies to figure out how long they've got to bake. So, you know, you might want to you might want to try that. And then the other artist I wanted to share. And I don't know That's if you know because it was artist. Yes, so, I know. Right, uh -huh. Austin. And he too is looking for variation in these sort of amorphic shapes. And okay. for his work, he, he deals with it with sort of clustering them in the middle, mm -hmm. sort of collapsing into the middle. But then, of course, later on, he does those sort of uh, humorous, terrifying pictorial paintings with you know the guy with the big eyeball and a cigarette but uh um anyway that's that's what i would think do you have any any uh any questions or thoughts about um, if you go back the previous slide my image on the right so this one yeah. uh, like the two figures so i was looking at matisse's black table mm -hmm. and i got inspired with that and i had sketched it somehow and you can see the table there but then i took off well and this is what i came up with i think the color gets a little up here the color gets a little muddy you know? yes and so you want to be really careful in laying down the color that it doesn't get get too um, confused, okay. and, and and so again, uh, I think I think like I was saying to Nancy, I would think about you know pay attention close attention to the warm cool relationships, and also you know that you want to have more of a value range you want to have mm -hmm. lights and you want to have darks you want to have half tones and you want to have steps in between you know so okay it's not um it's not all the same value i mean another person to look at for water for watercolor is paul clay k-l-e-e -E, yes artist but uh -huh. i think that um you know, maybe, maybe in this case, this is where you burn the cookies. 
on the right. I'm so, <laughs> talking about cookies. I just want to let you know you're over time, Jim. <laughs> you got to move on. Yeah. Well, thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate the yeah. all I, the classes here. My pleasure. It's terrific to see your work here today. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, let's advance. So, Philip Gustin, Emil Nolder. So, this is Alyssa White. Uh, I don't know, Alyssa, are you here? Probably not. And actually, I invited Alyssa to put this um, these pieces in because she took a live workshop with me uh, up in the Champlain Valley, and uh, and so these are a couple of graphite drawings, and I find them to be pretty interesting um, because she's really trying to see the whole space. And when I'm talking about specificity, I, I'm just not talking about descriptively, I'm talking about how this has a distinctive character from this, has a distinctive character from this, this, this archer boy here at King's, uh, at the uh, at, at you know, gardens at Ticonderoga, and that how she's distributing her attention kind of evenly around the space, like we were, we were talking about earlier, um, with Barbara and apropos to Cezanne. So I think that's that's a really interesting uh, thing to look at. Also, she there's a mountain in Vermont called Camel's Hump. Does anybody know it? It's a very famous mountain. And it's this this here. It's clearer in the next slide. So here's another uh, one of Alyssa's paintings. This is watercolor. And again, she's taking this idea and and trying to look at the whole space. And again, here's here's the, the Camel Swamp Mountain sailboat, you know, the buoys. This is a little swimming area at the Westport Beach in Lake Champlain, and which is now open again. We just had this uh, um, cyanoalgae cyanobacteria algae bloom, this sort of toxic algae that's been floating around the lake has finally disappeared. But, uh, but I, yeah, it's an interesting use of warm and cool. She's got the warm colors, cool colors, and integrating, you know, the linear elements, I think, pretty well. And the, so I'm just showing, just for reference, this is a painting by John Frederick Kensett. And this is his painting of Camel's Hump. The Camel's Hump is this big mountain. Uh, actually, the Indians called it Moose Shoulder. The Abenaki called it Moose Shoulder. But somebody called it, I think Ethan Allen called it Camel Hump. Not that he ever saw a camel. But, uh, um, but you can see in this painting, I mean, it looks very realistic, but it's actually greatly exaggerated. The actual height of the mountain would be about here in real life. But... But uh, for pictorial effect, Kensett decided to turn it into the, uh, to raise it to the heights of Everest. And so we go back, we can see this is probably more realistic, more accurate. So I also, uh, also, apropos to what we're saying with Barbara, I think in terms of Alyssa's work, I think there's some some kinship with Cezanne's approach, this idea, like I said, of hard won fragments of certainty scattered across a vast expanse of unknowing. Cezanne leaves blank areas that is sort of cerebral impressionism. It's not just we're going to mix the colors optically, we're going to fill in the blanks cerebrally because he, he's uh you know he doesn't feel the need to to cover the surface evenly with uh a layer of paint mm -hmm. but uh th this you know each one of these marks is a decision and on the right is a charles demuth uh who's a pennsylvania artist modernist artist part of the stiglitz group and he's borrowing the sort of Cezanne idea of 
of hard won fragments kind of scattered across this open space. And I'm seeing that here a little bit too. And I think that's a good, a good way to approach things. And just for reference, again, this is my painting of Camel's Hump. And you can see it's not, there's Camel's Hump. So it doesn't really look like this. Although we're so conditioned by photography that people would look at this and say, oh, that must be, that must, that's, that looks really realistic. So if they went to Westport and looked across the lake, they'd say, where'd the mountain go? <laughs> what happened to it? <laughs> All right, so um, next up, Last but not least is Martin Geiger. You here, Liz? Um, I'm here, yes. And Martin actually just got home from work, so I could go get him if, if you want. Go grab him. Yeah, yeah. So we'll wait for Martin to join us. Where is Geiger, who is an old friend of mine, and her husband's an old friend of mine, uh, is an artist. And she participated in our workshops, but uh, she's slyly uh slid her son into this process and martin is a recent graduate of the pennsylvania academy of fine arts so uh, here he is hey martin so uh i got a few of your pieces up here okay yeah and you want to talk a little bit about your process a little bit yeah um yeah mom i'm not sure about these photos these are um Well, okay, um, I guess my process more or less, a very quick pencil sketch to sort of block it in with major, major deals, um, major building, you know, alignments, lines, very quickly. You know, I don't spend much time drawing on, on these, these ones that you got here at all. It's, I spend minutes and then, um, and then I always start with a light layer, so the lightest colors first, uh, and then, then I usually combine sort of middle tone and dark into, and they sort of bleed into each other a little bit. And, um, and so it feels a lot like it's two layers, more or less. I mean, like I jump around a little bit too. It's not quite as mechanical as that, but that's more or less. So you try to divide things light and middle to dark and sort of connect them in those sort of wash zones. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty, uh, sound approach i mean start with light washes and and establish your warm cool relationship like dark relationships and then and then elaborate to the degree that 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 you feel is appropriate but what's what's interesting I, that i see here is i see marks that are not ultimately uh guiding the brush and and i think this is important for people to see that you know, when, when you're working with a linear uh, approach, you're looking at one set of choices and one set of decisions. When you start laying in color, mm -hmm. then, you're, then you're in a different thought process. So you don't want to think about it as technique. You want to think about the delineation, which Martin is doing, looks like in a very calligraphic, quick, uh, responsive way. Uh, that's a thought process. That's not a technique. And he's mapping things out and then going back and starting with light washes and building up warm and cool and dark and dark, uh, warm and cool and dark and light relationships. And what's it, what's interesting is, you know, you're saying to me, Martin, that you're not drawing that much, but you're drawing a lot with the edge of the brush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not drawing with, with a pencil, but you're drawing with the edge of the brush. And I think that that's another thing that's important for, for everybody to remember is that when you're painting, the edge of the brush becomes, you know, your pencil point that becomes that becomes your like linear um 
uh, expression. And, and so, uh, I mean, obviously we can't penetrate the paint to see, uh, you know, how closely or loosely uh, the marks follow the pencil line, but clearly the delineation with graphite is, is not is not like a coloring book. You're not following the lines. You, it's one thought process succeeds another. So, you know, you're looking at these buildings, laying down marks and lines, composing the image, measuring, mapping, and then when you start laying down color, it's a different thought process. And so you're looking at it again. And at least the way I look at it, I don't know about you, but I think in a lot of ways, the drawing phase, if it's linear and with dry media, is not necessarily preparatory for what comes later, but it's kind of a rehearsal. You think so? Um, yeah, I, I would say, Definitely, it's a very, very seldom do I follow uh, the pencil lines with, yeah. with, with the shapes. You know, it's 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 almost like a a gesture drawing or something. It doesn't doesn't totally map onto. Right. Uh, it's a it's a rehearsal. You're kind of, you know, it's your first it's your first whack at it, and and you're sort of teaching yourself what's there. Mm -hmm. and when you come in with with wet media, then you know what's there. You get a better idea. You're not just just entering the process cold. But by the same token, you're not following the lines. And that's that's the point I want to make because some of the artists we looked at previously, uh, you know, people like Rick Broson, uh, Don Stinson. I mean, these are guys who you know they lay down the drawing. The drawing is pretty much the guide for uh, how the color behaves. But your work's different, you know, your work is, you know, you get more of an a la prima process and uh, um, uh, it's responsive at every, at every stage. So that you have a responsive approach to drawing. And then when you come in with a color with warm, cool, light, dark, it's, it's continuing that responsive approach. The not confining yourself by what came before. And uh, uh, so you said before we started talking that, that were you unaware that these images were being sent in? Is this an ambush? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I just haven't seen the pictures. And oh. so there's, um, yeah, there's always a little bit of disconnect between the photos of the work. And yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure the same is true with passport photo, right? You wish you could have that taken off. Yeah. <laughs> They're not too far off. I just immediately I just saw saw stuff. That... Yeah, well, it ain't nothing like the real thing. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think that it's interesting to look at these pictures and see that you know you can accept this kind of puddling that goes on. It, the maybe brush was. <clears throat> uh five percent too wet and leaves this and then this nice intense accent here that really kicks the space kicks the light and uh so when you're painting like this i mean it's like taking a trust fall you know you just you're you you know you you know you know what the color's got to do you know what the value's got to do you know what the what you know the material has to do and you're just gonna you're going to give a little of that authority to the materials and to you know the process and see what happens and um oh, these are nice uh this is you know i think the economy here this one on the left is uh very intriguing is this is this where you guys live no, that one on the left is, um, I was visiting in Oklahoma. And so this is out in sort of the suburbs, you know, in the middle of the day. The, um, uh, Oklahoma City? Yeah, Oklahoma City. God, I can't believe, I, I never saw such low-rise houses with such ginormous 
honking big pyramid type roofs everywhere. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess it must be all those twisters that come through there, right? So. But yeah, I guess they, uh, it's certainly built like that. Are they twister proof houses? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, I was out there a couple of years ago and I thought, my God, this is a very funny, I mean, the suburban landscape, they all look like these bunkers, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, no, this is has a lot of real economy and it's interesting to see uh, the warmness of the roof, the coolness of these two parallel planes and letting the sort of warm tone of the roof bleed into this. It's interesting. And then also, I guess this must be some kind of hedge or shrubbery, right? Mm -hmm. Is it just me, Liz, or when I say, whenever we use the word shrubbery? I was I, just thinking, <laughs> shrubbery? Think about it. Anything <laughs> but Monty Python, right? But, uh, <laughs> generation anyway but uh but yeah this is a very well designed page you know and it's very economical and uh this is definitely one approach that that i think everybody should try here too warm and cool is this a swimming pool it is yeah and this is a an olympic diving board yeah Olympic, really? Well, I, sub Olympic, <laughs> suburban Olympic. Yeah, and this is a this is a person struggling towards the bar, I guess, right? Uh, just sort of struggling out of the pool. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this again. I mean, we were talking earlier about about the. Um, the synergy between uh, abstraction and landscape, between uh, abstraction and representation in landscape, and how many of the early abstractionists like Kandinsky and Mondrian and others <coughs> really developed their abstract painting process out of a landscape painting practice, out of a landscape painting practice. And, um, so, um, so James, yes, we are at three oh one p.m. I think okay. your timing is impeccable. And Martin, thank you so much. I'm so glad you got home from work. I'm not quite done, Sarah. I've okay. got one minute more. Thank you. One minute more. <laughs> I think you got it, James. So, um, <laughs> so I wanted to share a couple of other images, and I was like looking at your work, Martin, and I thought. Well, Hopper comes to mind, also Fairfield Porter. I don't know if those are artists who resonate for you, but I thought I saw in your work a sense of design that uh, I associate with somebody like Hopper, where there's a, a kind of a, uh, a cl an organizational clarity and uh, with Porter, then there's this responsive approach to painting that really kind of this premier coup um, painting on the spot, which is basically what he did. He seldom worked on anything for more than three hours. You know, he would like limit himself to uh, like one shot painting pretty much, whereas Hopper would elaborate things after the fact, not just in the field. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts from you? Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely thinking Hopper in terms of intense sense of sort of light carving out the sections on the page. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. It resonates with me. Um, certainly with these watercolors, also very responsive is the word for it. Yeah, I think so. rigorous composition but but um a very responsive approach to painting yeah yeah that's that's how it feels good well thank you for participating and contributing to this
adventure. And, Thanks, uh, Jim. and uh, does anybody have any questions before we all say goodbye for the moment? Sarah Linda? Okay, I just removed the spotlight so I could see everybody's smiling face. Uh, wow, hi everybody. Um, all I wanna say is I put my comments, my last comments in the chat. Wait, did somebody, Nancy, did you wanna say something? No, no, oh, I'm just. Okay. I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> no, just bringing up the gallery view. Well, I, I just wanna thank you all for being here and for being um, so forthcoming um, about your work and for doing such incredible work. Um, James, you know, thank you. There, the words, words cannot express how grateful I am for, um, for what you've done with this series. It's just so far beyond any, you know, any expectation. But of course, I should have known. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure for me as well. And I, I'm, ha I'm happy if uh, people are inspired by it to uh, engage in, in field work and sketchbooks or by whatever means. Uh, not just as a mode of producing works of art, but also as a way of becoming more engaged in their surroundings and learning more about the world around them. So, and and bringing in um, the art history, which is dear to my heart, um, was just invaluable. And and I think I, I could tell how appreciative everybody was. Um, yes. I really yes. thank you so much. And and I want to thank my. Um, I want to thank my colleagues who have joined us today, uh, Laura Vukels, Nancy Di Natale, and Mark Taylor. I hope I didn't miss anybody. And um, I, the good news is that the exhibition that inspired this series, um, that is supported by Art Bridges, has been extended uh, through February 6th. And it does feature a work by James. Yeah, we should nice. ask him what he wants us to turn the page to. That's right. That's right. We keep I, would, I might pick Poet's Walk. I would invite you to uh, turn the pages as often as you please. <laughs> well, we're about to turn the page. I was going to say, do you want to pick which image? No, or I was thinking Poet's Walk. I think that's an excellent choice. <laughs> okay, I know so we can do the walk. ceremonial turning of the page very, very soon, very soon. And yeah, um, right now it's Catterskill Falls. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Which is nice and cooling. But um, I did want to, there's a question from Joan in the chat, if there's going to be another session for those of you who were unable to, um, to join at this time. This is the culminating session of the series of five. Uh, I'm sure we will be working with James in the future hopefully in person, but at the moment, nothing is on the calendar. We'll be getting back to him soon. Um, and uh, and uh, just check our, keep checking back on our website. And please do, um, you, your names should be um, on our list for e-blasts, I would think. Yeah, and um, if anybody wants to be in touch uh, personally, uh, just to reach out, you can, you can, send me an email to workshops at needlewatcher.com or right that's in the chat everybody here uh, going up I put it in a little bit a little while ago so if you want to you can just click on it um, exactly workshops at needlewatcher.com and I have I have other workshops unfolding and and uh, you like like Sarah Linda said, I'm sure we'll be working together again through Hudson River Museum. So. I certainly hope so. So um, thank you all. Meantime, again, appreciate. I feel like I got to know all of you. And uh, please come and see us at the museum if you can. And um, thank you all. Have a wonderful thank rest you. of the day. And stay healthy. Have a good yes. summer. Thank you, you know. James. Thank you, Sarah Thank you Linda. so much, James and thank Sarah you. Linda of Hudson River Museum. Yay. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. 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 Bye.